Well, thank you to Dr. Tawari uh, for giving me such a challenging title. Um, I think it's a very insightful title because uh, those of us that uh, do imaging uh, are intrigued by the information, the new phenotype that's being presented to us, uh, and we speculate as to how useful that information is going to be to do the kind of things that we want a biomarker to do. And they are to discriminate disease from non-disease. That's usually a kind of sensitivity issue, but if you're uh, interested in clinically important disease, it's also a specificity issue. You don't want to turn non-cases into cases incorrectly. You also want to evaluate, which means you want to reapply the test over time to see if change has occurred when change really has occurred. Uh, and then that explores issues of reliability and responsiveness to key attributes of a test. We also want a biomarker to predict the future uh, based on its um, baseline characteristics, as we do, say, in kidney cancer. We use the tumor volume to predict the probability of metastases, but also one can use a dynamic uh, change to predict future events if indeed we detect a change uh, over time. And I think the modern uh, concept of a biomarker also incorporates predicting people or individuals that will respond to one treatment versus another. And it may be that the phenotype presented to us by various types of imaging, it can be MRI or ultrasound derivatives, can give us insight into um, therapeutic response rates. So uh, what else do we want from a biomarker? Ideally, it should be non-invasive, uh, easily reapplied if we have to, widely available, uh, applied across a broad spectrum of disease. It's not much use if it's just good for one uh, component or stage of disease. And ideally, we'd want it to be cheap. Um, what about an imaging biomarker as opposed to a serum biomarker? Well, it can give us information on localization, which um, a serum biomarker will never do. Uh, it can estimate volume, as we've just heard from Peter Carroll's uh, 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 talk, and volume is something that we've not incorporated not into our TNM classification of prostate cancer, probably the only solid organ cancer in which we don't incorporate volume. I'm sure that's set to change. Once you've got localization and volume, you can guide tissue procurement. We talk about PSA, but it's really PSA and trust biopsy. If we can accurately put our needle into the heart of the tumor, we can obtain representative tissue that is likely to give us um, uh, most of the story, if not the whole story. We also get anatomical information. So in other words, we can see uh, a tumor in a certain part of the prostate, which may or may not influence therapeutic decision making, the apex versus the base, whether it's involving the capsule or in the, in the transition zone. Uh, that's all key information not available to us in a serum biomarker. And there may be physiological information. Much of the imaging information that we derive from our various tests is physiological in nature. And that may give us insight into the biodynamics of the tumor. So multi-parametric MRI, in which there's most literature currently, but it's not the only imaging that's available to us, uh, gives us information currently on tumor size, uh, some information on tumor grade, and I'm sure Dr. Hrisak will address this uh, uh, in more detail, information on tumor stage, uh, it's very good at that, also on cell density, on vascularity, and on the metabolic uh, changes that are occurring in the cancer versus the background tissue. And again, that's all I'm going to say about the components of MRI. I'll leave it to the two very expert radiologists in the room to take this further in the next talk, and Dr. Claire Allen in her uh, seminar uh, tomorrow afternoon. So what do we get when we do an MRI? This is quite an old one, actually, November 2008. T2 sequence. Could we have the lights down a little bit? Hedy, can we see this or not? Can we? Um, so I think you can just about see this, but the lights down would be good, I think, for these talks. Uh, here we get a thumbprint. If you do your MRI on a 1.5 standard machine that's doing hips and knees in all your uh, hospitals uh, as we speak. This is the gadolinium phase. You can see the lesion light up there before the rest of the prostate does, exploiting the abnormal vasculature of the prostate. And here you can see the diffusion deficits. In other words, the movement of water within the tumor is less uh, than it is in the rest of the prostate because of the packed cellularity and membranes within there. Uh, if you get all three, the radiologist in the room will tell you there's about a 95% chance that this is a, a cancer. And if you put your needle in there, you'll be wrong about one time in, in 20. I'm not the first to say this, many others, but the ideal test in prostate cancer should probably test negative when there's no disease. I think there'd be no argument about that. But it should probably test negative when there's clinically insignificant disease. If we had such a test, we would get over the burden of overdiagnosis and the consequence of overtreatment. 
and we would want the test to test positive for clinically important disease. So that's the kind of ask that we want uh, in terms of the biomarker attributes of a uh, modern imaging study. And so this is, uh, these are prostate cancers that probably reflect the distribution of prostate cancers in the older men in the audience. These are from radical cystectomy specimens. They were not subject to any workup bias of PSA or indeed trust biopsy. We would want to test to test negative in the 146 tiny cancers that we saw in uh, these cystoprostatectomies. We would want the test to test negative in these very small tumors measuring 0.1 to 0.2 cc's um, I would argue. We'd probably want the test to test negative in between the 0.2 and 0.5 cc lesions, though in the younger man, we would probably want the test to test positive in that group. And we can apply a threshold on volume and deem whether the test tests positive or negative. We can be the arbiters of that, not the test. And I think we'd all agree we'd want the test to test positive when the, when it's, when the few tumors, as you can see here, there are 21 present uh, in this cohort of men that were uh, greater than 0.5 cc's in volume. So that's what we want the test to do. And it looks as though the test currently does that pretty well. Uh, this is now five years um, uh, in the public domain. This is the early work from the Lille group where they used uh, MRI prior to biopsy and verified it by radical prostatectomy, making adjustments for distortion and shrinkage and importantly applied volume thresholds to determine sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value. These figures were the first really to be published in a study of this type. Um, the study's not huge, but I think it's very well conducted. Uh, but the important thing is that these figures have, um, are pretty permanent. And I think as we go through today and as we hear Dr. Hrisak's talk, we will see similar figures. And I want particularly to draw your attention to the negative predictive value probably the most important attribute of a test if we use it as a triage test for men at risk, uh, and also the positive predictive value here. So in other words, the probability, if you were to biopsy that lesion, of that, of that lesion uh, being cancer, both extremely high. We've done similar things. We haven't used radical prostatectomy as the reference standard. Instead, we've applied a reference standard that you can apply to all men at risk. In other words, five millimeter template sampling, not a test we want to do forever, but a test that we have to do to validate imaging. And we've tried to stratify men into these three groups. And, this is the, and the paper describing the process by which it's done is, 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 will be soon published by the Journal of Urology. So in 131 biopsy naive patients, we applied MRI independently to the knowledge of the biopsy. They all underwent five millimeter template sampling. And according to these three definitions, two of which are clinically important, and the green one is clinically unimportant disease or, or disease that we would deem to be clinically unimportant, you can see very similar measures of performance in terms of negative predictive value, 95%, uh, sensitivity, specificity, and indeed positive predictive value. Positive predictive value in our group was lower uh, because we were applying uh, a needle independent of the, of the knowledge of the MRI. So the, both tests were conducted completely independent of each other. Uh, we'll see this um, in other studies, and I'll show you some, uh, some published work, most of which have been published this year, that documents uh, similar performance characteristics. This is probably better than mammography performs currently today. So first, the discrimination. Uh, identifying disease from non-disease. Currently, the kind of face validity, our ability to do that, is represented by our ability to see a lesion and then throw a needle at it and see what comes back. In the future, we'll have properly conducted, starred compliant studies uh, that will uh, support the information that we have now, but we'll have to wait a few years for that. Those studies have been funded and will be undertaken, uh, but it'll be two to three years before the results are available to us. So until then, uh, these are the kind of data that we have. I'm just going to take you through a few cases and then show you the data that's been published to date on this notion of targeting, which addresses this issue of face validity. Is what we see on the MRI valid and indeed reliable? Uh, this is the diffusion weighted image, the B1400 uh, image, and you can see the lesion. Yes, you can. Uh, I can see it very clearly here. I think you can make it out. Uh, here is the early uh, T1 gadolinium sequence, and you can see it uh, just up there. This is the T2 sequence, three millimeters back. Uh, again, the thumbprint right at the top there. No hope in hell of hitting this if you were to do a truss biopsy. If you do a transperineal biopsy and you target that specifically and label the targeted sampling, 
you can see that um, there was a hit in two of five cores. I had to go through the urethra to get this one. But it also, uh, all the other sectors of the prostate, these are the Barzell sectors, were sampled as a control. And you can see here the negative, the extraordinary negative predictive value of MRI. They were all negative. All those biopsy, all those needle deployments were wasted. The whole story, the whole story, was in the targeted biopsy. If you look, this is how we portray our histological um, uh, reports. They come back to us in a schematic manner, uh, which helps us um, plan uh, therapies. So how about uh, a guy with multiple lesions? Here is a left anterior lesion on the B1400, which you can see there, a smaller right anterior horn lesion, again on the B1400. Just below it there on the right, you might just, no, you can't see it on this. Um, and so these sequences are verified by the um, T1 gadolinium sequence. And again, a area anteriorly there that, again, on the T2 is confirming the previous sequences. Again, a very, very high uh, a positive predictive value here. And if you do exactly the same, so you try and target it, and then you take representative samples from the whole prostate independently, again, you can see that the whole story comes from two or three needles. Um, now, there's some double accounting here, so what, we, what you do first is to target it using a cognitive registration. I think it's there, and then we take um, representative samples from throughout the prostate. And what you can see is that the left anterior, 10 millimeter cancer core length, probably a direct hit, and the right anterior lesion, which is smaller, a 4 millimeter cancer core, maximum cancer core length, and they're represented to a less extent in the sampling that was done on the left and the right anteriorly, but not targeted. So they were kind of near misses of those tumors. They, they, they detected cancer, but in fact, they didn't get uh, all the information. So the maximum cancer core length was derived from the, the positive sample. We did miss one, which was the right lateral lesion, that uh, if we had the lights a bit lower, you would have seen a suggestion of a lesion there, and there was five millimeters of Gleason 3 plus 4 there that the MRI didn't pick up. MRI is not perfect, but it seems to be very, very good. Uh, here's another little story. So here we have the uh, opportunity to, to evaluate over time MRI in 2010, MRI in April or March 2011. There's a 15-month interval. And here you can see a lesion in the left peripheral zone of the gland. You can see it a little bit bigger here on the 15-month MRI, um, suggesting or, or here a slight increase in growth. On the diffusion scan, 2010, 2011, and you can hear, see the tumor creeping up the left anterior horn. And on the gadolinium phase, I think you'll be persuaded that there is a distinct change uh, in the nature of the tumor from that to that over an 18-month period. Now, he was diagnosed as having two millimeters of Gleason 3 plus 3 originally. We decided to MRI him and watch him. Uh, he had targeted sampling, which showed this, and it was a, basically a Gleason 3 plus 4 with some fragmentation of the cores, maximum cancer core length of six millimeters. But interestingly, on the targeted sample, tumor infiltrates fibroadipose tissue, suggesting extension beyond the gland. So by going direct for the lesion, the information is not only uh, more uh, precise, it gives us the true cancer core length, but also may give us additional material. There is an industry in targeting. If you go to the AUA this year, there will be four companies there persuading you to use their software to assist you in using MRI to help you target. Uh, they were all at the EAU, and um, you'll, you'll see them. These are the um, studies in the public domain. Four out of five of them were published this year in 2011. The top one is from the NIH, so Choiki and Pinto's group, which used um, uh, an image-to-image -image registration system. All others used cognitive registration. But you can see the types of um, accuracy. I'm not going to talk about evaluation. I think we need to, there's a lot more to learn about applying a test over time uh, and seeing just how stable it is. Uh, I, I'm sure our radiologists will talk about that and um, harmonizing the acquisition of the sequences so we can reduce between um, acquisition variability. In terms of prediction, again, very, very early, uh, a very nice study done in, in London in an active surveillance cohort in which the um, clinicians were blinded to the diffusion aspect of the MRI, and those men that progressed or, or went on to treatment in the active surveillance uh, group had a reduction in the ADC, so there was less water movement within that tumor than the other group. A small study, hypothesis generating, but suggesting that the changes that we see in the tumor the radiological, this new radiological phenotype may provide information in the future. 
Um, people are getting together. We're starting to talk. We're starting to harmonize acquisition sequences. We're starting to harmonize the way that we report. The breast cancer doctors had to do this before uh, mammography really worked. Uh, we did this in Europe. There was a transatlantic group that uh, we had the privilege of attending at Memorial recently. Uh, there's another consensus group that's about to publish in the Journal of Urology. This is the beginning, I think, of a very big story. The trial that will verify this, uh, if you can wait three years, and I, my fear is that we won't be able to because this story has its own legs, is really addressing this issue about applying an imaging um, uh, test prior to the biopsy. Can we biopsy fewer men as a result? This is a triage test. Can we biopsy better? Can we risk stratify better and therefore allocate treatment better? And this study is now going to run, been powered for 700 men. Many of you were involved in, in, um, in, in the study. Um, and I think we'll provide probably the definitive uh, information on imaging as a biomarker um, in a cohort of men at risk. So in summary, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, um, prostate imaging, uh, I think we have an extremely powerful biomarker that changes your prior probabilities dramatically. I think it can discriminate much, much better than the current practice standard, which is PSA and trust biopsy. We forget about the trust biopsy. I think it holds promise in its ability to evaluate over time and transform active surveillance, but that requires much more data. And I think it's very likely that some components of MRI will have very important predictive utility. Thank you very much.